Hello, 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 and welcome back to the More Money Podcast. I am your host, Jessica Morehouse, and this is episode 297 of the show. Thank you so much for uh, coming back and taking another listen for a fresh new episode. Uh, Very excited about uh, this next guest. I have Kathleen Burns Kingsbury on the show. She is the founder of KBK Wealth Connection and the host of the Breaking Money Silence podcast, and she's also an internationally published author and speaker. And what we're going to be kind of diving into uh, uh, in this episode is her her book. You know, (laughs) I'm also going to be giving away her book, just an FYI. So she has a book called Breaking Money Silence, How to Shatter Money Taboos, Talk More Openly About Finances, and Live a Richer Life. It is her fifth book. And oh boy, is it a good one. Is it ever a amazing, amazing book? And we have such a great uh, conversation about a number of different topics. But really, I mean, it's the whole reason I have this podcast is to break the money silence. And that can mean so many different things to so many different people. But uh, the main thing that I have kind of recognized, you know, since I started, you know, talking about money openly and, and writing about it, and then having this podcast, my YouTube channel, all this kind of stuff is, it is not easy to actually talk about money to share things about money to even learn about money because there's just so many emotions and feelings and judgments and everything wrapped up into it. And so it's it's not easy, but it's kind of vital. It is actually totally vital to our our survival and to our future success. And so it's very important. Um, so you're going to love this episode just as much as I loved recording it. But before I get to that interview with Kathleen, just a few uh, notes I want to share. Things that uh, you may or may not know about that I want to share before I kind of get into things. So number one, if you did not know, because uh, I kind of mentioned it briefly, I have a YouTube channel um, and I have a ton of videos. They're kind of more I, not more fun. They're just a different thing I'm doing uh, than the podcast because it is me talking to you, diving into a specific topic. I talk about investing and budgeting and, oh gosh, a lot of things on taxes in a small business for anyone who's interested in that kind of side of things. So make sure to check that out. You can find it at jessicamorehouse.com slash YouTube or just Google my name in YouTube. I'm also on Instagram and uh, having a lot of fun with Instagram reels. And uh, you can find me at Jessica I. Morehouse. You can also find this podcast on Instagram at More Money Podcast as well. And lastly, in case you've never heard or or maybe you haven't that you just need a reminder, I have an investing course uh, called Wealth Building Blueprint for Canadians. And uh, it is specifically focused on, you know, on a topic that I talk a lot about on this show, which is um, passive investing. So if you want to learn about how to either use a robo advisor or build your own index ETF portfolio with a discount brokerage, and you're like, yes, I want to do that. I just have no idea how to actually go about doing that. And also how much do I need for retirement? And how do I make an investment plan? And how do I do all these things? That's why I built this course. Uh, And again, it's specific for Canadians. So we talk about, you know, the kind of things that I think um, if you're not Canadian, you you won't touch on, such as our different registered accounts, taxation, our different products and platforms. I go in depth in the course and actually show you um, me opening up, I think, seven different accounts or eight different accounts uh, uh, at different robo-advisors. And then cut to 10 months later, show you what the results were and how did things go which is pretty cool. That is just one of the many things that I show you specifically in the course. So really, you can come at it as a total beginner. At the end of it, you will know exactly what to do, how to implement your plan and start investing. So that's my little spiel. Thanks for listening. Without further ado, let's get to that interview with Kathleen. Welcome to the More Money Podcast, Kathleen. I'm so excited to have you on the show to talk about a very important topic, which is uh, talking about money. We're going to talk about money and talk about the importance of talking about money. So, so excited to have you on here. Thank you, Jessica. It's really exciting to be here. Yes, and and very, very, um, you know, lucky to have you because you really did write the book on... <laughs> Literally, why it's so important to, uh, you know, break your money silence, not stay in silence and talk about money. And there's so many things and, and topics. I mean, I've been talking about money for a decade and you'll never run out of things to talk about. You'll always kind of find as you, you know, get into different stages of life, other things that are more awkward to talk about. I mean, I know one of the things that you talk about in your book is the importance of talking to, say, your parents about estate plans and stuff like that. That's a good 
fun thing that me and my husband are trying to navigate as we're, you know, in our 30s, our parents are um, reaching retirement or they're retired. So lots of uh, things that are important to talk about. But before we kind of dive right into the meat of it, uh, sh- can you share a little bit about yourself? I mean, I know you've been in this world for a very long time, have a number of books or a well-recognized speaker on this topic, but you got to share a little bit about your background. Sure, sure. Uh, My background's a little mixed. So uh, I started off in banking and finance uh, out of college and then realized over the course of uh, time that I really was interested in psychology. And so worked in the field of psychology for a number of years, empowering women and really enjoyed it. And then around 2006, 2007, I had my master's degree in psychology and I said, you know what, I want to just create my own business. And so I took everything that I love from Uh, the banking industry, which is primarily the education piece that you identify with, and everything I love from psychology, which is really the empowerment piece. And I said, how do I blend the two together? And I kind of made it up as I went along, wrote a couple of books, and look, it worked out. It worked out. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) On a personal level, I'm also somebody who's struggled with under-earning in my past and, you know, struggled in my marriage to talk openly about money. So, you know, I have a ton of credentials, but I also am a real person that has been through it because nobody has a perfect relationship with money. No, I mean, that's something that I've I think why I'm so attracted to this topic is um, I've had my own struggles and they have definitely evolved, whereas I've always been pretty like excited and open to talk about money, but there's so many things and emotions that surround money that it's really only been, I'd say, in the last five years I've I, you know, on also working with a therapist is helpful to really kind of open up uh, what some of those issues are that you're kind of just bearing down, like the shame or, you know, you mentioned uh, under earning very, I mean, I think a lot of women can probably relate to that, sadly, but of course I've dealt with that as well. And, um, you know, really thinking for the longest time you're under earning, not because I, I rarely thought it was because I was a woman and there's so much inequality in the world. I always thought it was my fault. I wasn't doing something. It was because something that I could or, you know, could control and and didn't do this, I wasn't good enough and all that kind of stuff. And I know, um, of course, you know, we'll kind of maybe dive into this topic first, because it's very relevant. And I see this talk, you know, everyone's still talking about, you know, the gender wage gap, why women are earning less. And it's interesting to see the different conversations taking place. Some people and I feel like this is, you know, the conversation we've been seeing for a while is, well, we just need to speak up for ourselves, the whole lean in kind of thing. We need to negotiate, which, of course, I think is important. That was something that I didn't know I should do. I never negotiated a job. I didn't know I was allowed. I didn't know that's something I could do. But then there's the real, I think, reasons why people may not do that if they know this is something they should do is the fear of, but what if, what if they take the job back after I try to get more money? What if I, you know, they don't even want to give me a second interview and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of like to to start there because I know you do talk a lot about negotiation. Um, where should people start when they they have an idea? I know negotiation is important. That is how we, as you know, women especially earn more money in our jobs, but I am terrified of even approaching it. Yeah, it's one of the most awkward financial conversations, I think, for men and women. I think mm-hmm. women are freer mm-hmm. to admit it than men. Mm-hmm. I think men often struggle as well. And I've certainly Absolutely. coached and worked with men as well. Uh, but I think when you just to start with the gender wage gap, I mean, it's it's such a complex issue. So there's systematic issues. And then there's the pieces that are in our control. And the part that is in our immediate control as an individual is looking at do we negotiate? Do we ask for what we're worth? Do we even know what we're worth? And certainly in my history, uh, when I started this business, I started and for the first year, I actually volunteered for 20 hours a week and worked in my business for 20 hours a week, not consciously. So it wasn't till all of a sudden I got this award for being a volunteer of the year that I looked back and I I stood on stage and accepted this award and I was so honored because I really believed in the organization I volunteered for. But at the same time, I looked to my right and my left and I said, wait a second, everybody on this stage but me is being paid. Now that, there's something wrong with that. And so I took a step back and I really looked at my psychology around money. And there was something about volunteering that was so much easier for me than being able to say, you know what, I have this skill set. this is my fee, this is what you need to pay. So I don't recommend this to everybody because I'm not anti-volunteering, mm-hmm, um, but, yeah, I went cold, <laughs> <laughs> but I went cold turkey. I couldn't mm-hmm. do the 
maybe a little, maybe a lot. That tends to be who I am. So I just said no volunteering for the first two years of my business. So it forced me to look at my relationship with money and to fill up those hours with paid work versus to fill up those hours with other types of work. So I know that's a long-winded answer to no, the no, beginning no, of your so question. That's so fascinating. But... Well, I'm curious, why Why did you, when you kind of were doing, I guess, more some self-discovery, why did you find it easier to volunteer than to ask for payment for your services? Yeah, I did some money coaching myself on this as well as, um, you know, self-exploration. And, and I really think it comes down to the messages that I was raised with were there was nobility of poverty, you know, a certain religion, uh, Catholicism believes in the nobility of poverty. There was also a very subtle message and it wasn't direct because I was raised, I was a woman, I had a sister, you can do anything you want in this world. But there was also a subtle message of don't get too full of yourself, don't be too successful or financial successful people there's something wrong with them. And it's not like mom and dad sat down and said that to us. It's like, I picked up on this message. And so when I started to create my own business, which I believe I probably would have never realized this about myself, I realized I had a fear of success. Like what if I was more financially successful than my parents? Would my husband still love me? You know, would my friends still hang out with me? And, and on some level in my head, I think how ridiculous, but there's some truth to it. We have trouble with women who are financially successful. We both say you should be, but then a lot of times other women, and I try to not be this type of person and surround my uh, myself with people who aren't like this, but there is sometimes this judgment that comes with, oh, she's so profit motivated in a way that's very different than what I see with my male friends or the males, um, you know, colleagues or business people that I work with. So I had to really look at that and and start to do the hard work that I now coach people to do, which is, you know, let's do the research. What are you worth? And let's start asking for it. And it hasn't been perfect, but I, it's kind of a superpower now. I like enjoy yeah. negotiating for what my worth is. Oh, yeah. That's so, I mean, I can relate a lot because I was also uh, raised Catholic. So I'm like, yep, that's a lot of the things yeah. that I discovered about myself. And it's interesting. I also had that realization of that, that fear of uh, like, but what if you do become successful? And instead of being excited, it really just scared me. And that, you know, was something that I had to kind of learn to overcome. But like you said, it's like we're we're told as women growing up or, you know, as girls growing up, you can do anything you want. But then once you become an adult, that's kind of not the same message you're getting. You're like, well, but don't be, you know, stay humble and don't want too much and don't be greedy and et cetera, et cetera. Whereas Certainly if you're a man, you probably, yeah, yeah, don't brag. Do no, brag. De- yep. no, don't ever, you know, do that. Whereas if you're a man, I'm sure you, you would not be getting that that messaging. You would be, you know, usually your praise is like, oh, look at this person. They're so successful, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I feel like that is something that I'm glad more women and people are, are talking about. There's more of a spotlight on that because it doesn't make any sense. And that's why I think a lot of women, especially as they enter their adult years, there's a weird disconnect. They're like, but I was told this one thing growing up that I can be whatever I want. And now I'm not, I'm told that actually, but don't, but don't, maybe don't do that. (laughs) Yeah, it's not attractive. It's not sexy. Mm -hmm. Um, There's one statistic out there of female breadwinners. 40% of female breadwinners downplay their earning status to friends and family because they're fearing the judgment of that. Now, part of that is internally, we have to just come to grips with that and be comfortable in our skin, doing what we were meant to be doing and being paid whatever our worth is. The other piece is we really have to look at society and go, that is that is crazy. Um, and, you know, there's other layers to it in terms of, you know, what your race is, your ethnicity. Um, but I think as a society, we have to really take a hard look at that. And I see women like you who are really breaking money silence, who are really talking about these issues. Um, but I have had those conversations with uh, women in their 20s and say, wait a second, I just graduated from college and I was told I could do anything. And now I'm told I can't. Yeah. So um, we have to really work individually at speaking up and then I and supporting other women. So that's why yes. I do what I do, because I really think it's so important to support other women and men mm-hmm. can support other women, too. Yes. So it doesn't have to be an either or it can be both. 
Exactly. I think for the longest time, it always kind of felt like this is a women's issue. But I think now the conversation is shifting. I mean, I've had so many conversations over the past several years with my husband and he just was he wasn't aware. And I think that's the thing. Most men are not aware because maybe they're just not part of these conversations. So it's not just important to have these conversations with yourself and then your your community of women, but also men so they can be our allies and they can speak up for us as well, because we can't. It's you know, I think that's the frustrating thing a lot of women um, deal with is it's like it seems like we're all the we're speaking up for ourselves in the room, but no one else is backing us up. We need to be backed up. So that's the only way that we're going to see significant change over time. So we're not dealing with the same issue for generations and generations. Like it's just, you know. Right. And my husband is actually the one who taught me how to negotiate because I grew up in a family where you just didn't do that. So I can remember we were buying our first dining room table and we had just gotten married and I wanted the brown dining room table, but the black one was priced lower. And my husband said, hang on. He goes, watch this. And he told me that I just really needed to focus on the black table. That's what I really wanted, even though I wanted the brown table. So anyway, we had this whole kind of shtick going. And we ended up negotiating and getting that brown table. I love that table. Um, I just recently (laughs) gave that table to my nephew's girlfriend. Um, And so it really represented the first time I negotiated anything and got what I wanted. And so I learned a lot from him. He's not great at salary negotiations. He learns from me in that area. But boy, is he good at picking up furniture on the cheap. (laughs) <laughs> you know, yeah. And and like you said, too, it's like, although women predominantly do deal with this issue, also like men do, too. I know so many men that, um, you know, people always expect me to be a good negotiator because I'm a man, but I'm terrible at it. I don't know what I do. I don't have that confidence. So it is like across the board, just something that we all need to get better at. But also, I think how we all get better at it is to have these open conversations about like, well, how much do you earn and et cetera, et cetera. I think that is one of the biggest things that I have learned is I used to only ask people, how much do you make um, when I was on the way out? Because I'm like, it's okay, I can ask you because I don't work here anymore. And it's like, you know how helpful that would have been if I did that earlier on in like the right way, because obviously some people don't want to share and that's fine. But now that I run my own business, I have a lot of these conversations with other small business owners. And it's so helpful to know. And also, I have lots of people that DM me asking about, you know, advice on what should my rate be and etc, etc. And I'm like, it, it helps if we all talk about this. Because if we all earn more, we all, you know, raise each other up and we're supporting each other. It's, it's better for everybody. Yeah, I think it's important to have the conversations. It's also important to respect if somebody doesn't want to have a salary conversation. But what I have found also as a small business owner is in order to make it, you need to surround yourself with a group of colleagues that will give you this information because it's not like you can walk in and there's a job description and it says, oh, that's 173,000. Uh, mm-hmm. You walk in and you're like, okay, what is the market rate? So part of it is really figuring out what the market rate is and having these conversations. And then I think the next piece is then dealing with the feelings that typically come up when asking for that rate. You you rolled mm-hmm. your eyes. And, and yeah, so what I ends mean, up ha- <laughs> Yeah, it's hard. And it is not the, fun. <laughs> yeah. And the emotional part, I think, is the part that where I, I really uh, can be helpful because if you look at your mindset, you identify your fears and your anxieties, and then you develop strategies for coping with them during before, during, and after the process you become better. It's like building up a muscle. You know, if you want to lift weights, you don't start with a 200 weight, you start with a 10 pound weight. And so it's very similar building up that muscle. And, and well, for the most part, I think negotiations is fun. Uh, It's certainly more fun to coach other people than do my own negotiations. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, oh, it's, I so agree that it's like a muscle because believe me at the, the get go that when I was just starting out, I was terrible at it, but I was just getting my feet wet. I was just trying, you, you figure out real quick what you should and shouldn't do. And now I'm in this position where I'm like, I feel pretty good. I mean, I have to negotiate pretty much any project I want to do with, you know, a a company or an organization or a speaking engagement. I have to negotiate almost every single day. And so then it kind of becomes like a habit and less intimidating scary. But when you're at the start of it, it's terrifying. But it's something that you need to practice uh, for sure. Um, I want to kind of switch gears a little bit because there's so many other important conversations that we need to have. Uh, Like I kind of mentioned, one that really, I think, struck me because I'm I'm dealing with it uh, now in my own personal life is talking with your parents about money. Something that I think for many years, maybe in your 20s, you don't really need to talk about it. At a certain point, when you get a bit older, you need to have these conversations because you need to find out, hey, mom and dad, 
Do you have a will? Do you have life insurance? Where, <laughs> Where is that key for the safety deposit box? All that kind of stuff. And that for me has been like a very interesting, it's a delicate conversation and not easy to navigate. So for people who are in a similar situation, what are kind of those the initial steps you should take because you obviously, you know, you want to take care of your parents and make sure everything is taken care of, but you also don't want to offend anybody. Yes. And I really feel for you. I've gone through that with my parents as well uh, years mm-hmm. ago. <laughs> so I so I understand, again, on a personal level as well as a professional mm-hmm. level. And, and in my book, Breaking Money Silence, there's a whole chapter on how to do this. Mm-hmm. But I would say the first piece that a lot of us skip in having these conversations with our parents is to really look at what emotions are gonna be brought up for you. Because as our parents get older, that doesn't always feel so good. It may not feel good for them, it may not feel good for you, and so, or it could be frustrating. You know, if your parents kind of shoot you down and it's none of your business or they avoid the conversation. So any of those feelings that we have, I think first you need to kind of understand what's typically gonna come up for me and how do I cope with those feelings? How do I get support? And then, you extend a loving invitation to your parents to engage in a money conversation. And what's important, because they're your parents, is that you allow them to have control, that you ask them for permission, and you try to meet them where they're at. So I'll give you an example. I worked with one woman where her dad was starting to fail. And she said, you know, I go in, I get so frustrated because I just want to be helpful and he won't listen. And so what we worked out was a strategy. And the strategy was that he would come to dinner every Sunday night. And every Sunday night, she said, Dad, can we just talk about for 10 minutes money every Sunday night when you come to dinner? And then I will drop it for the week. And so he said, OK. So every Sunday night, she'd be like, can I have a copy? You know, Do you have a copy of a will? Can you bring that next Sunday? You know, Do you have a utility bill? Are they being paid? Like these little, little steps. And what she did is she met her father where he was at, she made it doable, and she led with loving intent. And the only way to lead with loving intent, and you can't do it perfectly, is to process your own stuff about it and get support. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. And, you know, often parents will talk about money, but sometimes they won't start with the dollars and cents. So I don't know what you've started uh, or how you've started those conversations, Jessica, but sometimes it's even just talking about talking about money. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I'm doing with my parents is just, yeah, talking about money. Oh, actually, I think I've actually made some good progress with my parents and especially my mom. She's the the main money manager, um, which has been great. It's more the (laughs) in-laws. That's the that's the tricky bit, but uh, dude, we've got some time, so we're slowly. I'm gonna definitely uh, reread that chapter in your book and yeah. uh, take some notes. <laughs> Talk to the husband about it. <laughs> well, the, the the dynamics of the in laws is definitely different than the dynamics of your own parents, and it's really mm-hmm. interesting because every family has family money messages, and we're going to end up partnered with somebody. And they're not going to have identical family money messages. So that's another thing I think to factor in. And, and often I'll tell people, you know, start by asking your aging parents, what's one financial success you had? And what did you learn from that? Or what's one lesson you wanted to teach me as a kid? And then you start talking about that. So it's not always just about the dollars and cents. It can be about making them feel good about their relationship with money. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's that's a, a great way to kind of open up that conversation. It's not so intimidating, I think. Um, but I guess a, another kind of, a, you know, thing that we will all mostly most of us will probably encounter at some point in our lives is also talking about money with our partners or future partners. Uh, as someone who's I've been with my you know husband for, I mean, going on 14 years. So it has been an evolution, let me tell you from the get go. Um, and still, it's not like we're perfect. Believe me, my husband in general, would rather never talk about money. He just, it's, you know, that's his thing. He gets uncomfortable. He has his issues with money. We, everyone has issues with money, but it's, uh, it's like you said, it's like, it really was starting small. And what we do similar to that kind of uh, anecdote you shared is we talk about money once a month. We have a little monthly money meeting. We put in our, you know, numbers into a spreadsheet. We talk about it that otherwise we generally, I try not to bother him with it because he, gen- he doesn't like it. I, l- I could talk about it all day long, not for him. So I, I have those limitations. So we don't argue as much. <laughs> we have those kind of, you know, a uh, ways to kind of, uh, you know, just deal with it in our own way. But for, for someone, I guess, you know, I get asked a lot, you know, um, we're getting serious with my partner. We're going to move in together. 
what should we do? We've never really talked about money. And I think a lot of people, similar to like people are afraid to negotiate because they're afraid that maybe the the employer will rescind my offer. What if the relationship sours once we start talking about money? What would your advice be to someone like that? Well, I will start with the end in mind. If the relationship mm-hmm. starts to sour when we start talking about money, uh, that may be a sign that you're not money compatible and you've saved yourself a lot of years of fighting about money. Now, with that said, like you said, couples aren't perfect about money. And often we need to engage in that conversation in a way that's going to be helpful for both partners. And so what I say is, as early as you can in the relationship, start to understand your your own money personality, but also your partner's. So um, I also think that if couples are uh, planning a wedding, or even before planning a wedding, but planning a wedding, there are so many financial decisions you have to make. And so instead of fighting about it and saying, well, I want this and you, you know, you're not agreeing or you're doing it wrong, say, well, t- help me understand why are you making that decision? You know, why is that important to you? What value are you expressing by having this, you know, open bar <laughs> at mm-hmm. the wedding versus, <laughs> you know, I want to have really wonderful flowers, whatever it might be. And so I think that that's an opportunity. You can do that when you're dating. If you haven't, you know, you're married or you're in a committed relationship, you haven't done it, it's never too late. In fact, when my husband and I got together and we've been t- married like 24 years, together 30 years. And when we first got together, I didn't even know this till I did my own money work. <laughs> we got engaged. I am not kidding you, Jessica. We got engaged and the next day, because he was horrible with money. <laughs> the next day I took him to the bank, we opened a joint account and then I controlled it for like 14 years. Oh wow! And then I know, and I, it just so unconsciously, because I was good at money. I was a former FDIC bank examiner. You know, it just, it, in my mind made sense. And he was money avoidant. So he's like, yeah, yay. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> that was all really good and well until we got ripped off from a contractor. So we put an addition on our house and we lost tens of thousands of dollars from this crooked contractor. And as you could imagine, there was a little stress in the Kingsbury home. Mm-hmm. And what ended up happening is I dealt with it like I, you know, a type A money person that was a former bank examiner would do. And I got really anxious and really tight. And he dealt with it by playing video games. <laughs> and ignoring it. Right. Mm-hmm. So it came to a head one night because I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And instead of being the nagging wife, which quite honestly, I had been for a little while there, I decided, oh, I'd get curious and have a coach like mindset. And so he's playing this video game and I have the mortgage and I'm flipping out because I'm like, can we actually pay the mortgage? And he says to me or I say to him, I say, Brian is his name. I said, could you please just give me one moment? And to his credit, he put down his little gamer and I said, can you just tell me when you think you might start worrying about money? And he really thought about it. And he looked at me and he goes, you know what? I think it's when they repo the TV. I said, what? (laughs) Literally, that was his answer. I said, you mean when they repossess our TV? Like the cars are already gone. The mortgage is in default. It's the TV. And we started hysterically laughing. And in that moment, what we realized was, boy, we were raised very different around money. I, you had to have 25% in your emergency fund, very conservative savers. His mother was a single mom, not a lot of money. So you just did what you could. And from that moment on, it's actually part of why I have the career I have. I started to study money psychology, but then together we started to talk about our backgrounds. So I think it's really important to understand, like with your husband, what's his background? If he's money avoidant, why? Instead of judging it, just understanding it. It sounds kind of similar to your husband, raised by a single mom and low income. So yeah. Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot of things that make sense there. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting is over the course of time, and it's been, I don't know, a decade since then. uh, And we recovered, by the way. Uh, I won't get into the, just so people sometimes worry about that. Mm -hmm. We're good. Uh, And basically what my husband and I did is we started to talk about money and manage money differently. And we managed it together. Similar to you, meetings once a month. At the beginning, maybe it was once a week. And then uh, he started participating in the financial advising meetings. And lo and behold, Jessica, he had a really valuable perspective Mm. that was helpful. Mm -hmm. So now I'm not an oversaver. He's not an overspender. And we've met in the middle. So it takes some time. But that's the hope is that you learn from each other and create your relationship with money as a couple as you want it to be. Absolutely. Yeah. The the best kind of advice I was ever given is is really to 
try to put yourself in your partner's shoes instead of coming at it just from your point yes. of view. Try to not judge their their habits or their choices because again it's like they come from somewhere but yeah that the like you mentioned it is so valuable to really dig deep to find out okay what is your relationship with money what is your background usually it comes back to the parents or the grandparents and then you can start start to piece things together and they they kind of make sense you're like oh that's why you do this this is why you do that like my parents are kind of you know classic in that well maybe not super traditional actually because my mom is the money manager and you know usually it's like I guess the man traditionally but uh he also is very avoidant he doesn't care about the finances at all and uh but my mom is very you know also raised Catholic very conservative with her money always and also like she had uh you know uh grandparents or parents that uh experienced the great depression and so she is very much into like money hoarding and budgeting and da 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 my my dad is the opposite. So we always kind of talk. It's like if, you know, God forbid, she's the first one to go where me and my sisters are going to have to rally around, and <laughs> give him a budget or something like that, because he just doesn't care about that kind of stuff. But it's important to understand the background. So like, why do you feel like this? Or why do you act like this? It all comes back to their parents and, and how they kind of dealt with money. So yeah, it's definitely the parents. It's our society. It's mm-hmm. media. It could be you know, our yes. culture, our race our gender, their, their generation, yeah. there's so much. And it if you get curious about your partner, that's always what I encourage people to do, to get curious. Because in that moment, when Brian was playing that video game, instead of being judgmental, I got curious. Like, when are you gonna worry about money? And that curiosity can be really helpful. Do your own work, and then, it's not that they, you have to force your partner to do the work, but get curious with that other person. And I do find that when you understand what's behind people's financial behaviors, they make a little bit more sense, or at least you can have a little bit more compassion. And then together, like I said, you get to make it up as you go along. There's no right way to do money. There's just mm-hmm. the way you, and in, in if you are in partnership, your partner are going to do money. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I like that too. That's something that I've had to learn over the years because lots of people have some strong opinions when it comes to money management. There is actually no right or wrong way. There's a million different ways to get to whatever your desired result is. So it is kind of important to get, you know, information and some ideas, but then you make your decision uh, ultimately at the end. Um, One thing I kind of want to just like kind of talk about kind of uh, as we kind of wrap up is, uh, you know, just for people who are still on the fence about, oh, I know I should be talking about money, but I really don't want to. What are some of the possible repercussions of not breaking that money silence, of just staying in your silence for a little bit longer? Longer. What could happen? Oh, there's so many repercussions. Uh, it, you know, it's statistically, if you look at couples that don't talk about money openly and honestly, or don't learn how to do it in the process of their relationship, it's a key contributor to divorce. If you look at families that have money to pass down to the next generation, 60% of them don't successfully do so because they aren't having these money conversations. Uh, It also can lead to uh, betrayal, uh, financial infidelity. Uh, And for women, as we mentioned earlier in the podcast, and men, it can lead to under earning. So there's a lot of negatives to talking about, to not talking about money and to not breaking your money silence. What is so positive and what people don't realize is because that fear or anxiety comes up, is that when you do break money silence and you do engage in these conversations, your intimacy in your relationship improves your relationships with your friends improve, how you feel at work ultimately feels better, you feel valued and not resentful. And so there are a lot of upsides, but because we live in this culture of money shame and money silence, we don't actually experience the upsides that much. My guess is since you have started really talking about money, there's probably been a lot of upsides for you. I know there have been for me. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, like you mentioned, like the intimacy and we just feel closer. Like that is, you know, ultimately it has been so like immeasurably beneficial for our relationship you know like you mentioned um you know a a big cause of divorce is to do with money and not talking about it or financial infidelity and that was always a big fear of mine you know again being catholic you're like i'm told not to get divorced right and you know well one way to to kind of you know avoid that is to to talk is to have like open communication and i'd say like the only downside to that is like it's a bit awkward and uncomfortable you just need to push past 
past that. And then you'll realize, oh, I'm so glad I did this. I'm so, so glad. It just makes everything so much easier to navigate. And yeah, like one of the the great things I'd say about our relationship is the one thing we don't really argue about is money because we talk about it consistently. So there's no surprises. There's no gotchas or anything like that. Right. And also, if you're raising kids or you're role modeling to nieces and nephews, as I am, you're going to want to set, you're going to want to show them how they can talk about money through your behaviors as well as your words. And I think we can change the next generation of our society if we continue to have these conversations. If you continue to have your podcast, I continue to do the work I'm doing. And everybody who's listening out there just dares to have one money conversation after this podcast that maybe they wouldn't have had before. And I'm talking five, 10 minutes. I'm not talking yeah. three hour conversation. Yeah. We can ultimately change the world. And I know that's a lofty goal, but that's what I'm up to. <laughs> yeah, that's what you're doing. And that's why I love it. I signed up to your email list to get the, because you have this thing where it's like 52 uh, kind of ways to start conversations. So before I let you go, I know you've got so many great resources on your website about, you know, breaking money silence and negotiating fees, conquering your fear of negotiating. Do you want to kind of share a little bit more about some things that people can find if they are to look you up or go on your website to help them out on this journey? Sure. If you go to breakingmoneysilence.com, you'll actually see the free campaign. You sign up and you get one small money talk tip a week for an entire year. I love mm -hmm. that campaign. Love that. I think it's really useful. I encourage everybody to do it. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about negotiation and the psychology of negotiation, uh, you can go to courses.breakingmoneysilence.com. There's free courses. There's master courses. In fact, I'm starting a master class now for a small mm -hmm. group of eight women that I'm really excited about. And there's a couple of openings left. And then if you want to check out my book, you can go to you know Amazon or any bookstore. Mm -hmm. And I've said it a few times, but I'll say it again. It's called Breaking Money Silence. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Kathleen, for being on the show. It was such a pleasure to have you on and to dis discuss this topic that I'm so passionate about uh, in depth. So thanks so much. Yeah, I've loved the conversation. Thank you. And that was episode 297 with Kathleen Burns Kingsbury. Make sure to check her out at her website, breakingmoneysilence.com. You can also follow her on Twitter at KBK Speaks. You can also follow her on Instagram at Kathleen Burns Kingsbury. I will include everything in the show notes, so it'll be very easy for you to find all this information, um, including, you know, how to get her book and also how to enter the contest to win her book. Just go to jessicamorehouse.com slash 297 for all of that helpful information. Okay, so since I mentioned I'm giving away her book, I also, I'm going to give away a copy of all the books that are featured on this season of the show, as I always do. So if you go to jessicamorehouse.com slash contests, that is where you will find the big book giveaway of all the different books. I will update um, that page as new guests on the sh you know come on the show and they have a book that uh, I want to feature and uh, give away. So make sure to always check in. Another great way to kind of always stay in the loop is to get onto my email list. If you go to jessicamorehouse.com slash subscribe, that is how you can do it. Another thing I will let you know about that um, you may not know about, and I actually just did a little revamp of it, which I'm really proud about, is I have a free resource library. So I have a bunch of, you know, guides and worksheets and cheat sheets and spreadsheets uh, all for free. Um, so if you go to jessicamorehouse.com slash resources, you can, uh, you know, sign up for an account and access all of my freebies for free hence the freebies. Um, so you can check that out if you like. And just as a reminder, because I did, you know, mention it a little while ago at the beginning of this episode, um, I am on Instagram. So make sure to follow me. My, I'm, This is why I'm telling you this, because you're like, why do you keep on talking about this? Because I have a, on my goals list, on my little vision board um, to get to 10,000 Instagram followers by the end of the year. And uh, well, we're, we're getting close to the end of the year and I don't have it. And I really want to check that off my list. So if you help a friend, your friend Jessica, make sure to go to at Jessica I Morehouse on Instagram and follow me, please. I promise I'll make it worth your while. I do lots of Instagram AMAs where you can ask me whatever the heck you want, um, usually on a certain topic or whatever. You try to do this every single Tuesday. Um, you know, I'm doing a little bit more um, Instagram lives. I did one not too long ago with uh, Liquid Independence. Obviously, that's not his real name, but you know, it's a... Um, He's the Freedom 35 blog. I've known him for, gosh, as, as long as I've been blog, like at least a decade, which is crazy. Um, and Bob Lay from Talkhan was also on uh, the IG Live, and it was a lot of fun. So I'm probably going to do uh, 
more of those because why not? It's a, I have a, a good time. And also I'm doing more Instagram reels because honestly, this girl doesn't know how to take a photo. She like her life depended on it. I, believe me, I try my best. Thank goodness I do have uh, some skills in the video department so I can make Instagram reels and actually they're a lot of fun. I try, I, I don't know about you if you're like on TikTok or Instagram reels or whatever, but I always try to you know make them have a lot of fun, show my husband. He does not understand. He does not get what, he doesn't get it. He's like, what is this? Why is this funny? I don't understand. So it's just me alone in my house making Instagram reels, hoping someone <laughs> other than my husband will understand them. So make sure to follow me on Instagram. <laughs> And uh, lastly, just to remind you, if you want to find more information about my investing course, Wealth Building Blueprint for Canadians, uh, I've linked to it in the show notes for this episode at jessicamorehouse.com slash 296, no, 297, sorry, 297. Um, and also you can find it at jessicamorehouse.com slash WBB, or just go to the shop page, actually. I'll, I'll direct you to my shop page. That is where you can find um, all of the different budget spreadsheets I offer, my course, also some merch. You may not know, but I have some merch. I have a fun merch mugs, some hats, some shirts that I think are really good because honestly, whenever I wear the hat or their shirts outdoors, I always get questions about them. Always just like, oh my God, where'd you get that hat or that shirt? And uh, it's kind of fun to be like, I made them myself. So if you go to jessicamorass.com slash shop, you can find more information about that. I also want to give a big old shout out to my podcast editor, Matt Rideout. Okay, that is uh, it for me. Thank you so much for listening. I will be back here next Wednesday with a fresh new episode. So I will see you then. Have a good rest of your week, weekend. And uh, yeah, if you're wondering, since I talked about it in the last episode, um, how is the house hunting going? It's going. <laughs> it's go we don't have a house yet, so... Nothing to really update you besides the stress and anxiety of house hunting. It's not fun. I'm not having a good time. I cannot wait to update you telling you that we have found a place to live. But so far, it's looking a lot more like, well, we're going to stay in an Airbnb for a little bit at the end of uh, November and December. And then going to be in my parents' place in December for Christmas time. And gosh, I hope we find another place to live after. Otherwise, I might just be living in my parents' basement. So that's what's new with me. So yeah, thanks for sticking around for that little bit. But, um, okay, that's it. That's it. I'm going to leave you there. Thanks again. We'll see you here next Wednesday.